you know, time travel gives the, the writers the ability to go back and erase things, as you say, errors that have been done in the past, but it also gives uh, uh, the, you know, sort of illusion of um, the ability to modify um, from between media. So, for instance, um, in X-Men the Animated Series, it was Bishop that went back in time and traveled. In the original comic book story, it was... Um, Kitty Pryde that went back, and in this one it was Wolverine, and each of them had their own sort of different tack on on how the story would have went at various you know uh, points. But uh, Kyle, um, what do you think about um, sort of the the twist on time travel that uh, this movie took, as opposed to some of the other stories? Uh, yeah, I thought it was an uh, interesting way to to kind of liven up the the time travel storyline. Uh, in, in most storylines, the, the the character goes back from the future to, you know, somehow change or stop a future from happening. And once they're in the past, the, the future is set, you know, unless they change the events that, that occurred to create their, you know, subpar future, you know, unless they can change it, it is fixed. In this movie, it was, it was an interesting, I guess, device to kind of have them fighting off these sentinels to, you know, to give Wolverine more time to change the past, and if they would have somehow failed and Wolverine would have died, then the mission wouldn't have even mattered because Wolverine would immediately revert back to the future and be dead, and there's not even that chance to change the past anymore. So I really liked that it, it kind of changed up the whole time travel thing and made it a little bit different than your basic Terminator um, plot line. Um, so in different like comic books and uh, in the TV show, the animated show, there was kind of like this whole um, let's do it differently as well, where Bishop actually went back in time in the animated, com uh, animated series and was on the lookout for um, a traitor amongst the ranks of uh, the X-Men. And he kind of replaced Kitty Pride as the main time travel character, and this was, uh, I guess, the way for them to introduce Bishop into the... Uh, like the this animated series because he had been not a character so far and he's quite a popular character or at least was back in that time period which is really funny because in the comic books Bishop came back kind of on the same premises but in a different storyline where there was a traitor amongst Xavier's ranks and it wasn't played out until the Onslaught series when the majority of the X-Men end up getting wiped out by a mysterious force and it turns out that it's actually Xavier himself who, because he had taken uh, the time to mind wipe uh, um, Magneto after Magneto had removed the adamantium from Wolverine by pulling it out through, like, the sores in his body and basically just, like, just right out of his body. That had, like, gotten inside of uh, Xavier's head and created this uh, being of pure psionic energy who was Onslaught. So it's kind of like a twist within a twist within a twist of these different, like, time travel arcs and how it all played out. That's it. Okay. Good point. Good point. You make a solid it's point. Rel it's relevant. <laughs> it is relevant. Actually, uh, what else is relevant is Rab's comment about the actual movie not being as dark as I had originally sort of commented. I, I think that the storyline is dark, and I think that the outcome is dark, but I think Rab's point is the movie was not as dark as it could have been. What did you, what did you mean by that, Rob? Well, I think even though the, the uh, material is dark, especially in the comic where they go to great lengths to explain, like, what's gone wrong with the world since we last saw the X-Men, like, which would have been about 30 years, I think. And, um, th but the... The fact is you don't see in the movie most of the stuff that we would think is dark. Like, um, you don't, I mean, you do see a bunch of skeletons and you hear about people dying, but you don't see all of your favorite characters murdered before your eyes. I mean, you do, but then they immediately come back because they went back in time, like, five minutes. Um, so it's not really as dark. Really, where they... they they focus their darkness, like the more dark themes are on things like uh, Charles Xavier in the past and how he's all a wreck because everybody left him, and a drug addict even. That's that's pretty dark, says I. The only X-Men that they actually say dies is Beast. Yeah. <laughs> because 
in the movie, he asked if he survived, and he's, Wolverine clearly states no. But they actually added more X characters to the beginning future section like than Blink. actually having them killed off. Well, Blink, Warpath, and Sunspot are all added as new characters. Oh, and Bishop, too. Uh, but they don't actually say that anyone from the past gets killed. You see the body of someone who had an X logo on themselves, but y there's no actual person that's dead. No one we know. It, that's good, too. I think it's good that they they don't dwell too much on that. Like, <clears throat> It's good to be in the past where all of the action is, and like Kyle was saying, using that special uh, mechanic where they have to go back, or, or where nothing actually happens until he wakes up, or nothing is actually set in stone until he wakes up. Using that mechanic, we get to see action in the future, even though all of the real stuff is happening in the past. So you get a nice dichotomy between the two continuities. Speaking so of continuities... I can make my second point here. Speaking of continuities, um, all of those continuity errors, I had, I had a theory. As I was watching the movie, I was sort of questioning whether the X-Men we were seeing in the future were even the same X-Men that we saw in the original trilogy. Like, maybe they're from a different timeline. Maybe they're an alternate timeline's version. Like, maybe the time... Like, if they're willing to say that the timeline can be changed, then clearly they may, they may not even be from the same timeline as the original three movies were. So sort of like the Star Trek movie, the new 2009 Star Trek yeah. movie, it's like, it's actually divergent. Yeah, just... Well, like I think they locked down... I think they locked down that it's not divergent when they had Wolverine wake up again in the future and... You know, they're pushing on the fact that Gene and Scott are alive. They're there. They didn't die. So that kind of flows into that continuity of those first movies that we saw. Uh, sorry, the third movie that, like, back in the day. Which is unfortunate. I really don't like the fact that they actually showed Scott and Gene in that situation. Because, in my opinion, if Wolverine was to be walking through the halls of the school, and the, the first thing he would do is he would smell Jean. He would smell her from a mile away. The true traditional Wolverine would have been like, Jeannie? And it's just the way it would go. And Well, <laughs> it is, but that's the way Wolverine's relationship was with her. It was on the verge of creepy because he had such this profound love for her. So I'll, I'll give you that. Um, something else I want to talk about... <laughs> I, I'm just going to dismiss the point because you're right, but it's a, it's a, I think it's a, mi a bit of a minor story point that he bumped into her leaning in, a, in the archway of a door as opposed to smelling her from the extra 25 feet, the extra 10 steps. No. My, inner, my inner geek is just like had to complain about something about the movie because it was such a good movie. It was, it okay. was really well done. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so a couple of uh, things I want to talk about. Uh, the first is uh, DC's actually kind of got their own thing going on right now called Future's End. It's a story um, with sort of the similar plot where someone goes back in time to avoid uh, a catastrophic future. Um, what? How does that compare to the Days of Future story? Uh, Days of Future Past storyline, and uh, how successful has it been for DC? The premise is that Brother Eye, which is this satellite that was uh, established in the mid-2000s in Batman continuity, anyway, uh, and Infinite Crisis. But anyway, Brother Eye is this satellite, and it has built nanobots, or it's built ridiculous robots out of nanobots that are sort of attaching to human flesh and eliminating all humans on the planet. And... Um, by the time we get to the story, pretty much everybody is dead except for Batman and future Batman. It was Terry McGinnis, uh, the Batman Beyond that we know from the TV show. And so Terry, or 
It was originally Bruce who was going to go back. I'm spoiling this. It was originally Bruce who was going to go back, and then Terry goes back and discovers that he was actually sent five years too late to change the thing that he was supposed to change, but we don't know what it is yet. And uh, But anyway, he goes back in time after pretty much everybody has been murdered to stop that, which is essentially the same plot that everybody has been wiped out and somebody needs to go back to fix it. It's funny that they used uh, Brother Eye, the satellite, because didn't that create the OMAX as well? Yeah. Which were it's, essentially, it's, like, humans converted into robots. So what's the difference between some kind of nanobot invasion and making everybody OMAX? There isn't one. <laughs> it's okay. gory. The future's in. It's much pretty much gory. the same thing. Yeah. Interesting. Do you okay. have anything to say about it, Kyle? I don't know. I mean, I think you covered the the main plot of it so far. I mean, what they've done in, in you know the subsequent issues is basically kind of give you a tour of of some of the main players in that the the five years too late timeline. And I mean, so far the the main plot of the story happened in that first issue where we saw the, the horrible future and and Terry McGinnis come back, and he's really not done much to to stop this from happening yet so uh, you know hopefully hopefully they build to that soon I guess where it differs from days of future past is more that you don't see anything that's happening in the present like Kitty Pride goes back to the present or what is the present in X-Men stories at that time and then but in in future Zen Terry is only seeing stuff that we aren't seeing yet in present day comics so it's different in that way okay so on an unrelated topic I want to actually just jump over and talk about uh, a rumor I've been hearing about um, obviously uh, Fox produces the X-Men series Sony produces the Spider-Man series and Fox is also going to be working on another Fantastic Four reboot I personally didn't mind the uh, Ian Gruffold, uh, Jessica Alba, uh, Michael Chiklis, and we won't talk about how uh, we've got a, a duplication of actors there, Chris Evans, but um, I actually didn't mind those two movies. They were fine. Um, they weren't spectacular. I think they were entertaining individually, but Fox has decided to go off and make another Fantastic Four reboot, and the rumor in the rumor mill is that Marvel is going to cancel the Fantastic Four comics. There were actually two Fantastic Four comics going on. There was Fantastic Four and then FF, and those have sort of been, um, or at least FF has been canceled, if I'm not mistaken. But um, the rumor was that Marvel was going to do everything within its power to sort of sabotage the the Fox reboot of Fantastic Four by by killing the comics. Uh, Tom Brevoort has recently come out to, uh, to you know, sort of nix that uh, rumor and say that's not the case. But what do we think about sort of the interplay between the, the continuities? Like, um, Days of Future Past has intermingled between a couple of different Fox properties, but do we think that there's any um, hurting or helping that Marvel can do to the, the, the cinematic various cinematic universes? Or that, say, Captain America, which is a Marvel Cinematic Universe competes against or can help or hurt the Fox properties. Is that true, or do we largely believe they're independent of each other? I think they're independent. I, uh, I mean, I think Marvel can help a movie, but I don't think Marvel canceling a book can kill a movie franchise. If anything, the movies would help the comics, I would think. But I think for Marvel, the benefit is just in having movies of their books made. like Because they are present regardless of whether or not the studio, like, Marvel is still attached to Fox properties, Marvel is attached to Disney, or whatever the company that holds Disney is, uh, or, um, you know what I mean. Um, Marvel is still attached to Sony, like, they are, they are present regardless, even if they can't cross over between the movies. I know their eggs are all in the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe basket, but there's still Marvel to be had at the other two uh, production companies. Yeah, I don't think like whether they canceled it or not would have real any like re- any real big effect on the actual movies themselves because they really do stand alone. And 
because of the way that they're moving with this new Fantastic Four, I don't think that the comic books would, like, if they canceled it, I think people would still come out to see the movies. And even, like, even the fanboys are going to come out just because of how they're doing it and changing the characters and changing a bit of who is playing those characters. I mean, there's already been a big, a big stir about it already. So I think, if anything, they, like, just leave the comic books and leave the movie. Everybody's still making tons of money. No one really cares. I mean... As a fanboy, I would love to see how Marvel uh, Studios would do with a Fantastic Four movie, how they would play it out, who they would cast for the movie. But for the most part, I mean, it's the rumor was kind of silly. Um, it, it was I almost was like, yeah, Marvel, like stick it to Fox because Fox just give back those rights. But like, whatever. I actually agree with you completely. Um, I would have loved to have seen them stick it to them, but realistically, it's never going to happen. And the rights will revert when the rights revert, and until then, we wait. Um, I have one last topic which I'd like to toss out there for everyone to comment on, and that is uh, the stinger again uh, was En Sabanur, or at least a, a younger version of Apocalypse in the ancient Egyptian histories. Uh, he was, uh, or at least he tells himself in the animated series as being the first mutant, uh, and you know we see him with vast, vast powers, and set, uh, he's the the creator of the pyramids of ancient Egypt, obviously, or at least according to that stinger. Um, where do we think the story is going to go? What do we think the character is going to turn into? They didn't say Age of Apocalypse. They didn't say um, you know Legacy Virus. They didn't talk about anything specific uh, in terms of plot, but we know who the baddie is going to be, and that gives us probably a really good sense of where the movie's going to be. What do you think? Well, I thought it was really interesting the way that they played out his powers because it's almost like he had some kind of uh, telekinesis abilities, like to the extreme, where he was able to move all these blocks, which is really kind of differs from the powers of the apocalypse, apo apocalypse from the comic books because his powers were a little bit different. He kind of was like a techno... Uh, morph where he was able to interface with lots of different technologies and able to incorporate them. Like his suit that he had was a uh, suit that he acquired from a uh, crashed celestial ship and he was able to augment himself with that. But he also had like body augmenting powers where he was able to turn his arm into a giant hammer and smash it into the ground and stuff. So it's, uh, it's really interesting how they're going with that. I mean, I'd like to see them... Uh, you know, kind of stick to certain canons about the uh, original character. I mean, it was a nice homage to see the four men or well, four people sitting on horses in the background of the uh, the shot. But uh, you know, it's uh, it really all depends on how they play with it in the uh, upcoming movie. So people will say that uh, Apocalypse is uh, a corollary or a copy or uh, an homage, if, if you give a lot of respect, to Darkseid from the DC world. Um, do you guys, do Rab uh, or Kyle, do you guys think that Darkseid will make an appearance in the upcoming DC movies, especially now that we know Batman v Superman is uh, a sort of a, the first of many JLA sort of movies? I think he'll show up eventually. He's he's kind of a household name as far as, as you know big DC like powerhouse villains go. I think it would be hard to see more than than maybe two or three movies without Darkseid making an appearance somehow. I don't know how they would present him, but I feel like even if he is a household name, he works in like the cartoons. He works in like Justice League, Unlimited, and Superman, but. I don't know. I feel like the whole uh, fourth world thing just sort of doesn't really fit with a realistic-ish universe. I don't know. Maybe maybe it will work. Well, what about what about and, Thanos? Like they've introduced Thanos at the end of the uh, the first Avengers movie. He's sort of a a purple baddie as well, right? Like I mean, this sort of over the top. Uh, character with too much power and a physical structure that looks a little weird. Like we've got tech, we've got the technology now to make a character look good on screen. Do you really think there's such thing as a, an inaccessible character now, one that d won't translate to movie very well? Not without adjusting something. Uh, but I, it's interesting. Like the Stinger uh, in Days of Future Past. Like uh, what's his name? Whose name? Apocalypse <laughs> is isn't even wearing a suit in, or at least he's wearing like a burlap sack. So you don't really, 
he doesn't look like you would expect him to. So you don't know. Like I, I didn't know anything about the character really because, of course, I'm a DC loser who doesn't pay attention to Marvel. But the, <laughs> but when I watched it, I had no idea what was going on. I just knew it looked really cool, and I was excited to see what was going to happen. But I, there was no like that guy is definitely apocalypse to me. So. Well, it's really funny because a lot of viewers are going to see the same thing. They're going to see this, like, stinger, if they stick around for it, of this kid who isn't really menacing, isn't, it, it's not really like a tease of what's going on. They just kind of showed this group of obviously Egyptians, because he's building the pyramids uh, out in the desert, uh, cheering on for En Sabanur, En Sabanur. And, like, even then... Like, my wife turned to me in the movie and said, what are they saying? And so I had to explain, and she kind of, like, once the, the came around the front, she kind of understood what was going on. But it was a really poor stinger. It's a, like, stingers need to, like, both tease things for ultra fans who are going to be like, ah, titter, titter, but they also need to... Uh, they also need to tease something for people who don't know anything about that so that they can look forward to what's coming and be like, what was that? Ooh, that looked cool. I, I should look that up on the Marvel database <laughs> and find out about it. A and also, I should really see that next movie so that I can follow up on this mystery that's been presented here. But so far, the mystery is this guy created the pyramids, and I don't really know much about him other than that people shout his name. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds like a good as place as any to end for this week. So thank you very much for joining me, Mike, Rab, and Kyle. And uh, we'll see everybody next week.